Welcome. What we're going to talk about today is teaching an accessible online course. So I hope that's something you're interested in because that's what we're going to talk about. My name is Cheryl Bergstaller. Uh, my email address is s-h-e-r-y-l-b at uw.edu, which means that you're welcome to email me after the presentation or anytime uh, with questions or comments or even suggestions for making this uh, more productive. Um, I direct two units as part of the Accessible Technology Services Unit, um, at, which is uh, part of UWIT. And so we have two units within this. The IT Accessibility Team, that's the group that's sponsoring this presentation, um, which started, actually our efforts started in 1984. They were pretty min minimal at that time. We were talking about adaptive technolo technology for an Apple II computer most of the time. Uh, but anyway, we were providing some service to make sure that technology is accessible to faculty, students, staff here on campus. And we still do that. Although we uh, have to talk about websites and uh, uh, application software and all sorts of technology, even documents that are presented electronically, um, how can we make those accessible? So much more of a, uh, of a broader scope that we're um, addressing and more staff, of course, to go with that. That's all funded by the UW, but many people know um, me and people who work for me as part of the Do It Center that I direct, which is uh, a center that started in 1992 uh, with grant funds. So now it's currently supported by federal, state, corporate, and private funds. Uh, Do it stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology. And so we've been um, operating a lot of projects over the years, uh, taking a more holistic approach uh, to helping people with disabilities be successful in their college uh, courses, graduate school, and careers. And, um, and we continue to do that with uh, funds primarily from the National Science Foundation, but from other organizations as well. We even have a Do It Japan program um, started in 2007. You can look at their website. Uh, if you don't know Japanese, you're not gonna be able to understand most of it, uh, but they do much of what, the same thing that we do here uh, in the Do It Center. And we started the Center on Universal Design and Education in 1999 through one of these grants, um, which was funded by the US Department of Education. So we take kind of a student-centered approach um, and, a, and with taking a look at all the various stakeholders like you that can contribute to the success of students with disabilities. Uh, of course, working with students with disabilities is important. So they're prepared. You see them over in one of these little boxes on this uh, wheel, uh, family members and so forth and their peers and near peers, adult mentors. All these people can play a role. Community groups, special programs, service providers like Disability Resources for Students, K-12 teachers, and then we get to post-secondary administrators, faculty, and staff. And so I think everyone uh, on, at our class today is in that broad category. And so the question is kind of what can we do, and especially when it comes to online learning, that can contribute to a, creating a level playing field for students with disabilities who are in our classes. And then there are employers, technology vendors, legislators, policymakers and funding agencies, all of our projects, the Do It projects, deal with at least two of these different groups. And uh, so today, we're gonna think a lot about what faculty members can do to either erect barriers for students with disabilities or make students more successful because they can access the resources and activities you're presenting in online education. Our basic approaches within Do It and actually within the IT accessibility team as well, is when we're working with the individual students, we're really focused, focusing on self-determination, uh, broadly um, understood as a, uh, the many uh, skills and knowledge uh, and the skills, the knowledge and um, networking that you need to be successful in whatever you're trying to do. And we help them do that. And then we work with faculty and staff, institutions, technology companies, and there we promote universal design. So you can hear a lot about universal design um, as how as a foundation for these practices I'll be talking about. So what are we shooting for? Well, I think an inclusive environment could be the whole campus, could be your course, but has three characteristics. First of all, everyone who meets the requirements with or without accommodations is encouraged to participate. And that would be anyone that's in your online course because they were able to register for that online course. But then it's also important for them to feel welcome. If you have a video, an opening video, I teach online and I have one of these little five minute videos introducing myself. Um, but if your opening video is not accurately captioned, then that's very unwelcoming to some students. That would include students who are deaf, but also English language learners who rely on accurate captions in order to understand content. And then everyone is fully engaged in accessible and inclusive environments and activities. 
And so making sure when you have small groups or even you have people uh, communicating on the discussion board that you ask questions in such a way that, that everyone can participate. Today, I'm just gonna talk a tiny bit about history and legal issues. Then I'll talk about the accommodations only and the universal design approach uh, to providing access to students with disabilities, including to online learning. And then principles and examples of practices for creating your inclusive online course and resources. And then we'll have some uh, time for questions and answers. My course here is a, an overview. And so you're not gonna hear a lot of details about how to make a document accessible or whatever, but we have a series of presentations on Thursdays, one a month. Um, and you can get that through the accessibility website uh, where you may have heard of this course in the beginning. Um, and I'll give you that URL on the last slide. So I'm just gonna give a one minute history lesson uh, as far as the evolution of responses to human differences that takes us to where we are today. Um, we have a long history, we human beings, of eliminating, excluding, segregating people that, that we feel like don't fit in, including people with disabilities, which is unfortunate. The middle of the last century, there was a big leap forward um, as far as curing and rehabilitating and accommodating people with disabilities, um, particularly in the curing and rehabilitating, uh, it was possible because of medical developments. And then came, came the GI Bill um, after World War II and the veterans when they returned. Many of those veterans uh, came back with multiple disabilities that they would not have survived in earlier wars. But they also had this GI Bill, which paid their college tuition. And so guess what? A lot of people with disabilities, all veterans, showed up on our post-secondary campuses. And that gave us a big boost to think clearly about accessibility. But the focus was on accommodation. Okay, let's, let's um, see if this person can, uh, can uh, participate in this exercise um, that had not been developed with them in mind uh, and see if we can make do, you know, good enough sort of thing. Now we're in an age of universal design, uh, which I'll define in a few minutes. Um, followed by accommodations. But in, sh in short, it means that we're focusing more on design. At least we hope people will focus more on design. And then there may be some additional accommodations, but not quite so many. The legal basis, uh, there are two primary federal laws. We have some state requirements as well. Uh, but one is the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Um, and uh, many people are surprised when I bring this up, because we didn't have an internet back then, so how could we have uh, requirements to make our online courses accessible? Well, this is a civil rights law. And as a civil rights law, it basically says that when we're making offerings, if you're a covered entity, which the University of Washington is, then you need to make sure that uh, you provide accommodations for individuals with disabilities so that they can participate. Then there's the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and its 2008 amendments. Most people have heard about this. It's very much like Section 504. It applies to more, uh, to more uh, units. At the University of Washington, what we have to do is pretty much the same as we did for Section 504. So we've been doing this since 73. And one of the things that 504 required is we have a disability services office and our office is disability resources for students. I think for a group like this, where you're not actually providing the, the resources in DRS, uh, that it's more helpful to think about abilities rather than disabilities. And to think about the idea that everyone in the course has a range of abilities in different areas. Um, everyone doesn't have a disability, but we all have abilities. And so I have a double-edged arrow here from the left, not able to the right, able. And we could all rate ourselves right now on our ability to say, understand English. You might rate yourself low in this category because English is not your first language, or it might be that you have a disability, a learning disability that makes it difficult for you to understand written material in English or any other language perhaps. Um, so it's not necessarily related to a disability that you might be rating yourself low. So similarly with social norms, um, students on the autism spectrum often have dis dif difficulties understanding social cues. People from other cultures, same thing and they would all maybe rate themselves some, somewhat low in this category. And so the idea here with this, um, this uh, image is that everyone can rate themselves at different levels for different abilities, but we all will have our unique profile. So we could follow up by rating ourselves as the ability to hear, the ability to hear, see, or walk, uh, the ability to read print, to write with a pen or a pencil, 
to communicate verbally, to tune out distraction, to learn and to manage physical and mental health. Um, and you probably could, could name some disabilities that are related to these. But memorizing disabilities in the medical diagnosis isn't all that useful when you're designing your class. You just need to think about this great variety, which we'll talk about um, a little bit more uh, in a minute. So another thing to think about is most disabilities are invisible. And so you really can't tell if a person in your class, whether it's on-site or online, must, might have a disability. That would include the learning disabilities, attention deficits, a lot of these disabilities, most students with disabilities. Uh, you'd not be able to tell at a, particularly at a, a casual glance. And then adding to that, there are fewer than a third of students with disabilities that report them to the Disability Services Office. That's our DRS. Um, many people are shocked by this, um, but students with disabilities do not have to report to that office. They only report to that office if they think they're going to need an accommodation. And some students uh, don't report. I am also, I'm often asked why uh, by an audience like this. Uh, and uh, that's personal information, so I can't, I can't answer for any particular person. I can say in talking to students with disabilities over the years, uh, what usually comes up is something along the lines that they're worried about being discriminated against, um, or they're worried about being embarrassed about it. They don't want their faculty member to know because they might, fa the faculty member might not think they're qualified to be in the class, things like that, which is unfortunate, um, but is the case, but it's good for us to know. And Disability Resources for Students offers accommodation. It doesn't do a lot as far as making your course more accessible uh, from the get-go, to make it born accessible. So all of these things combined and kind of complicate the issue. It's not enough just to sit and wait until you get a letter from DRS um, to uh, provide accommodations for a particular student. Uh, there are other students that might need assistance as well, but aren't asking for it. And maybe there's a way that you could design your course so you'd be helping them out too and still providing the extra accommodations these other students might need. So a couple of common um, accommodations in online courses here on our campus and others is making inaccessible documents accessible, mainly uh, by you and those that are in, in uh, PDF format are the ones that are the most problematic. PDFs can be made accessible um, and Gaby on our staff teaches one of these Thursday sessions on how to do that. So you can look ahead to that schedule, but it's going to take a little bit of work. It can be harder than Microsoft Word. Certainly, it can be harder than making your content page accessible if you just put the content within the page within the uh, Canvas. And then captioning videos. Um, some people are surprised by that too, because, you know, like, for instance, if you save your video as a YouTube video, uh, it automatically captions. But I think we all know that it, uh, those computer generated captions are not very accurate. Uh, no punctuation, spelling of misspelling of words. And when you think about it, that's kind of a mean trip, trick for someone who's deaf or someone who's an English language learner if you give them inaccurate captions that don't have proper punctuation. So that just gives us a chance to talk about universal design. So universal design is the design of products and environments. That could be an online course. That would be the materials and the, the uh, resources that you use and the uh, activities that you create to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So we might need to make some adaptation or uh, some accommodations, but with universal design, you're trying to minimize that is the idea. I'll give you a quick example that kind of indicates the process of universal design and how you have to start at the beginning. An image on the screen right now shows a plastic name tag holder with a name tag in it with my name on it, um, and it, it, it's attached to a lanyard. Um, lanyards, I have been told by different conferences, are the most popular way for people to, to display their, their name tag. I'm not a big fan because I think it, it hangs down too low, so it's hard to see it, and sometimes it flips over and it's blank on the other side and so forth. I really like a pin so I can pin it to the, whatever I'm wearing, or I can put a clip on my collar. And so our staff years ago, when we were doing on-site programs, it seems very long ago, I'm sure it does for you too, um, we set about to, to universally design a name tag. And so we start with the purpose of the name tag, as you always do with universal design, you know, giving the name of the person that is wearing it. Uh, and so we made that uh, the, the first name, the important part of the name tag. So it's very large. My first name, Cheryl, is very large and the other text is smaller. Um, also, if we put uh, the do it 
logo or some other information about the conference, we keep that small too, uh, because that's not mainly what the name tag is for. Most people know what conference they're at. They want to know what name of the person is that they're looking at. And to solve that problem about flipping over and having a blank on the back side, that's easy to fix. We just put the name tag on the back too. So it has a front and a back. It doesn't matter what side is showing. So but if you look a little closer to this, the lanyard has a, a ring on it at the end, a metal ring. And it attaches to a clip, which was on the plastic name, name tag holder. And so I, because I don't want the name tag, the lanyard, I will take that off. I immediately unclip it and I'll clip the name tag on my collar. Uh, and if I'm wearing a sweater without a collar, then you can notice here that the, um, there's a safety pin that goes through that, that, that uh, clip. And so I have a pin there as well. And so we provided three ways uh, for people to use this name tag. Uh, holder uh, and fix some things like making the name on both sides and making the name large and so forth. That's universal design. It's kind of thinking through a little bit more. How can we please um, as many people as reasonable or possible? Uh, I'm sure some people would come up with a better idea for themselves personally, but these are three options rather than just giving people one option. So rather than taking a vote on which is the best one, you say, well, can we build in this, these, this flexibility? So applying universal design makes your materials and your, your activities in your course technically accessible. When I'm using the word accessible, I mean uh, related to people with disabilities, that people who are blind can access those materials. People who have mobility impairments and are using assistive technology to access the keyboard can use those materials. But it also means that it's usable. Um, and the difference there uh, can be uh, explained by a little example from Hadi, who works for me, who's, who happens to be blind. And he was talking about a software package that was, he was evaluating for accessibility. And uh, it, was, it was a rather focused type of software. It wasn't a big general, uh, you know, huge installation. And uh, he, he said that it was technically accessible, but the way they made, they made it accessible was to design it initially as an, uh, an, an inaccessible product. But then they made a couple of, of quite a few um, shortcut keys, you know, commands, uh, that you could use to access all the functions in the software. And he said there were about a 100 of them. And so for a blind user using a screen reader like he does, which reads aloud the text on the screen, he would have to kind of memorize 100 different ways to do things. And this is a new package. He wasn't even sure what the features were. Um, or maybe keep have a Braille printout or something. Uh, anyway, that was a pro program, a software program, that was technically accessible, but was not usable. You can't use it easily. And that applies to everyone, that you should be able to get through your online course. Think of your online course, think of, yeah, go through it as if you've never seen it before. Can you find various things? Do the student have to hop around, back to the syllabus, back to the content page? Do they know when to give a discussion? In my course, I have these different modules, as most do. And within there, I'll have a couple of lessons, but then when it's time to go to the discussion board, I have a little notice to tell them to go to the discussion board next. And so that'll kind of drag them through the course. And then inclusive. Inclusive means that all students are using the same uh, materials that are flexible for everyone uh, to use and that they can participate in the activities that you've created. I came up this, with this uh, quote from a Vietnamese Buddhist monk and I thought it was all about universal design, particularly of a course. When you plant lettuce, if it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it's not doing well. Uh, it may need fertilizer, more water, less sun. Um, and so that's the way we should look at our courses. When our students maybe are having difficulty understanding an instruction that we've given them, like a description of a project, and you have they're asking you questions about it, maybe multiple students, think about why they're confused. Because it might be that you could rework that assignment and describe it in a way that everyone would be able to understand what it means, or at least more students than currently can. We've done this uh, universal design in another context in the physical environments. For example, the universal design of sidewalks. On the page right now on our screen, there is an image of a young man in a wheelchair, and uh, he has on the back of his wheelchair a sign that says, he's, cle he's clearly shouting because it's all caps. Ramp the curbs, get me off the street. This was in 1970 on the front page of, you name it, the Daily, the University of Washington student newspaper. 
Well, back then they didn't have curb cuts in sidewalks, not, at least not very many. Uh, and administrators back then at post-secondary institutions thought it was just gonna be too expensive to redo all those sidewalks. And the key word here is redo. It's not all that expensive to put a curb cut in a sidewalk when you design it from the beginning, uh, but it can take a lot of work to, to put the curb cut in later. And now we see that curb cuts and sidewalks are just standard. I think if we had someone complain about a curb cut not being there, it'd be someone pushing a baby stroller or, or someone trying to skateboard. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be a person with a disability. So that's an example of a full adoption of universal design in a particular application. But back to technology and online learning. Thinking of technology, I'm making things accessible and, and usable and inclusive. Um, technology has built-in accessibility features. Back in the olden days, when I was talking about the Apple II computer, you couldn't press two keys at the same time um, at, with one finger or a stick in your mouth if you're a, a user that, that does not have use of their hands. And so you had to have a, an additional hardware to add to the Apple II computer that lock those three keys so a person could do shift in a number or letter uh, sequentially. Well, that is built in, it's called sticky keys. So we built in the mainstream technology as much as is reasonable, including our course, make it as accessible as reasonable. But it should also be compatible with assistive technology that people might be using. And so our course should be compatible with, with uh, screen reader technology I mentioned that Hadi, Hadi uses. Um, and for with adaptive keyboards and so forth that they might uh, be using. And the beneficiaries of universal design are many. Uh, in the case of videos, we've talked about this a bit already, but the captions benefit people who are unable to hear the audio, um, people who are English learners, um, who are in a noisy environment like an airport or a noiseless one, like they're trying to watch a video um, in, in their baby's room and the baby's sleeping, uh, people who have a slow internet connection, People who simply want to know the spelling of words, that should be everyone in your class, um, and people who need to find content uh, quickly um, and can search through that content with the player, it can allow you to do that. So one thing that we should think about is instructors should consider the characteristics of students that might be in the class. So this is proactive, so you have to be thinking about who might be in my class and the assistive technologies that they might be using. Um, when you're developing the course, think about those things. Well, give me, I'll give you some examples. These are four pictures of people that I know. Um, one of them you already know, Hadi over there on the right. Uh, we'll get to him in a minute. But if you design your course so it's accessible to these four people, it will be accessible to most everyone. The first one is Zane, and Zane is deaf. So she's a good reminder that you need to make sure that you're, uh, that you're, that you have captions and that they're accurate. Um, Anthony is next. He has multiple physical disabilities uh, and he does not have a usable voice. So he has tons of assistive technology uh, and he, he, he can, you know, he uses an adapted keyboard that he can operate um, and so and some switches and so forth. He interfaces with a telephone so he can use his computer to generate a message that can be read aloud on its, his telephone so he can operate a telephone and, and make telephone calls and so forth. But the main thing that you need to know as a person developing a course or IT um, online is that Anthony can use that technology and any other assistive technology, someone with disabilities similar to his, to operate the keyboard. He can, he can emulate the keyboard completely. He can uh, do anything that other people can do using the keyboard, but not necessarily the mouse. And so if you're developing a website, for instance, to share resources with your students, to make sure that there are any features that where a person would use a mouse, like a pull down menu, um, that they also uh, could reach those features by using say the arrow keys on their keyboard. So it's a fairly simple idea anyway, it's not always easy in implementation, uh, but webmasters, for instance, around campus, we tell them to make sure that the keyboard alone uh, can operate the, uh, the website. And you still have the alternative to use a mouse. Then we have Jessie. Jessie has multiple learning disabilities, which make it difficult for her to get her thoughts uh, down on paper, but also in, into the computer. Um, and so she narrates rather than typing to, to get her messages in. But she also has difficulty reading and spelling words. And so she uses a text-to-speech software package 
which will read aloud the text on her screen. Not as many capabilities as Hottie's because she can actually see uh, the, uh, the screen, uh, but does that reading for her, reads aloud. Uh, what Jessie needs is, remember I talked about those PDFs earlier? She needs to make sure that those PDFs, if you're using them at all, or any other document, can be read with her text-to-speech software, which means she has to have access to the text. Um, many PDFs, for instance, are scanned in images, and her, her system would just wouldn't be able to read that, those words on the screen. And so you need to format them in a way that she can read them. The last person on the screen here is Hottie. Uh, he's he's probably not going to find him as a student in your class, but he's been an instructor of online classes um, and faces some of the challenges that, that blind students might face. But he uses a screen reader, and that screen reader needs access to the text as well, just like with Jesse. And so he, uh, he, uh, he, you need to make sure that that PDF, for example, has text. It's actually text in the document. It's not saved as an image. Um, but he needs a little more than that because he needs to know the formatting of your document. So if you structure your document with heading one, heading two, heading three, heading one again, um, like we do, rather than just, uh, you know, bolding uh, letters and calling that a heading, Hottie wouldn't see that as a heading, um, as those with sight would. And so you just use the heading structure. Could be in your content management page in Canvas, for example. Could be in your Word document or your PDF. But you need to use that formatting capability that's built into the software. Um, similarly, there, there are ways to format your tables, uh, your lists, um, and so forth, so he can be alerted to what, what's coming up. Like he said, there's a bullet, bulleted list with seven items, and that gives him a lot of um, help in understanding that, that document. He also needs, um, if you're creating a website or even in your content management page, your web content pages, um, if you have a link, it's helpful for Hottie uh, if you have that link text to be descriptive rather than just be consistent and say, well, I'm just going to say click here, click here, click here. I might have a page in my class that need five links in it. Uh, and I put descriptive text so that you'll know this, this is the Do It website. Uh, this is to the University of Washington or whatever. Because if a student wants to go back, uh, they need to read that descriptive text that a screen reader can click from link to link. Uh, so blind students then can go back and re, re look at those web pages that they linked to at one time, rather than having to read all the surrounding text in order for it to make sense. That's an easy thing to do. Kind of like the curb cuts though, if you've uh, put click here, click here throughout your course, it's gonna take a little bit of work, a little bit of time to go back and, and change into descriptive text. So Hadi doesn't have to hear click here, click here, click here. And so he needs the formatting as well. So think about these four people when you create your class and you'll be a long way towards accessibility. I'm quickly gonna tell you about the sets of principles that have a play in all of this. There are three sets of, sets of principles that have the foundation of universal design. They're the basic principles of universal design, the seven principles uh, that apply, apply to physical environments, to uh, to uh, commercial products initially, but then to technology and even to online learning um, and other, um, uh, other applications. Uh, but two other sets of, of, of guidelines are helpful too that build off of universal design and give you more specifics. One is the three principles for universal design and learning. Um, and the other one is the four principles that underpin the web content accessibility guidelines, the technical specifications on how to make your website, but also all other IT accessible to people with disabilities. Now, we're not going to go through these, um, but I can uh, give you a little cheat sheet here. If you do apply all of them to your online learning course, it's really going to amount to two things. First of all, you're going to provide multiple ways, different ways for participants to learn and to demonstrate what they have learned and to engage. For example, uh, if you're teaching a concept, uh, you might have students look at a video, uh, but have that content, similar content in a written form as well. Some students would choose one over the other. Many students would benefit from both. Um, and so they can, they can uh, hear it and see it and they can read it um, and so forth. And then have different ways to test your students. Um, so it's not all just on, you know, two large tests, but you might have a portfolio, you might have assignments where they can show 
uh, what they've learned in your course and apply it in different ways. I have two big assignments in my class that I'm teaching now. And one of them is very specific about what they're supposed to do. Step, 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 step. And then the last assignment is, is really open-ended for them to take all the content in the course and to create a web, uh, web, uh, a, a webinar or, or uh, write a paper or, or whatever that they'd like to do. So they can, they can take the, in the second one, they get to use their skills to their best uh, ability to, um, and also consider their interests to present their project. And the first one is just very, um, very specific. And then to engage. In my syllabus, I tell students that uh, if they'd like to meet with me, I used to say, or, you know, I used to say they could come to my office or they could uh, email or whatever. Now I say, well, you can email um, me or we can meet by Zoom or Skype or whatever technology you'd like to use. Um, so the idea here is you give your students some agency in choosing um, how they want to communicate with you because it's really about them and what they're comfortable with. It's not really my business, my, 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 me to say that, well, I like Zoom. You know, what do you, what do you want? You're the student. And then if you've done those things, then the second principle then is to ensure that all the technologies, uh, so your PDF documents and your, your content management system, the learning management system, which Canvas is pretty accessible by the way. Uh, facilities, maybe you teach a hybrid class and you're using a makerspace for some of the activities, is that accessible? Uh, the services, the resources, and the strategies are accessible to individuals with a wide variety of abilities and other characteristics. And so you, the first one in multiple ways of doing things and then making sure everything's accessible, particularly to students with disabilities. We'll quickly go through some tips. I put together a 20 tips for teaching an accessible online course. It's only to help instructors get started. And most people that are here in this presentation are just getting started. But you'll see some things on this list that you're already doing. Um, and I'll point out why it's so important to students with disabilities. Um, and then you can add maybe some things to do um, gradually. Because universal design, you can apply the, the practices incrementally. You don't have to do everything at once. So you can decide, well, I'll start with these two or this one. Uh, just do that for now. Um, or you can uh, maybe think, well, I'm going to focus on the first week of school uh, so that my introductory video and the materials I use are fully accessible because I might have a student with a disability that needs to talk to the disability services office. And so I'll give them some time uh, so they won't get behind uh, the very first week of school. It has um, in the handout, I'll give you the URL at the end, um, it has, has how-to references. And so it'll tell you how to do each of these things. It also comes with a tutorial. Uh, and so it describes each of the 20 tips. And so you might uh, prefer learning in that way. Um, and developed from research, read a lot of articles. Um, as some of it was research to practice articles and reports of online instructors. And we work with a lot of students with disabilities and often they're on panels and they share their experiences online and what uh, they found most um, difficult in their online courses. So here we go. I'm just gonna share some of them. Um, so presenting your content in multiple ways and using multiple ways to communicate and demonstrate learning, those that's from that, that list of uh, number one on that list of practices. Be sure that your videos are captioned. Um, and so that's good. YouTube is, has a, an editing feature as some other um, platforms do as well. And so you can go in and edit your captions um, or you might have uh, resources on campus. We have a, one, of the Friday, one of these Thursday classes is on captioning. And so you can learn how to do that. Audio description is good too. Um, and it's um, where you get additional video or audio content in your video presentation for someone who's blind. Um, if you're creating your own video, like that introductory video I mentioned, um, you won't need audio description if you make sure you have spoken all the content um, that is being presented. You don't say look here or over here, that sort of thing. I'm doing that today, I'm demonstrating that today. Um, to describe whatever is important on the screen. There might be an image once in a while that I don't consider to be all that important for someone to know that that image is there if they can't see it already. Be sure you have clear instructions. This is the, one of the number one things that, that students with disabilities tell me when they're frustrated in their courses, both online and on-site, is, um, is the instructors are not clear. And so that, Think about that. 
um, and see if you can improve your instructions. Sometimes when we give instructions, we forget that these are you know less experienced students than we are, but also they're not familiar with the content um, to the same degree we are. And so we need to be really clear about those. Another thing students with disabilities point out in this list of you know most important uh, considerations is consistent layouts and organization. When we went uh, online in about a minute and a half, I think, uh, back in uh, 2020, I was very uh, empathetic to faculty on our campuses and elsewhere. I, when I teach an online course, it's, a, it's very different in developing it, even if the content's the same than on site. And so faculty members had to throw what they had, you know, PowerPoints and handouts and things that they had. And one of the um, problems that resulted is inconsistent layouts and organization. For some students with disabilities, this really throws them off. Uh, if the fonts are different, if the uh, the format is different. And so that's important to consider. We always talk about PDFs. Um, PDFs, um, you can just avoid them, but that's what I do. I know it's going to be harder to make them accessible. And when I want to edit my syllabus, let's say if I put my syllabus in PDF, then it might be tricky to get it back accessible again. And the rules for doing so can be different on a Mac and a PC and so forth. Um, but if you want to uh, learn about making PDFs accessible, then by all means use them. We have a PDFs on our website, actually, um, but we have about 100 handouts, small um, handouts on our Do It website. Um, and we have, if you go to those handouts, you get into the HTML version, which is the most accessible, but we have a separate version you can link to, which is an accessible PDF. Um, and so we, we link to the most accessible one, and then we provide a PDF option, mainly for people that want to print them out. Back in the olden days, when I talked at, talk at conferences in person, um, I always liked to have a handout people could take notes on, uh, let them know where the accessible one is as well, of course. Um, but I would just avoid them unless you want to take a workshop and, and learn how to do it right. And then don't use scanned in images, PDFs. Faculty ask me all the time, yeah, but I, I'm not creating the inaccessible PDFs. First of all, can I tell if it's accessible? Well, unless you take your, the, uh, the uh, go to the presentation or take a workshop on it, you probably can't, but the one quick way to see if it's not accessible is if you try to select the, the text with your mouse, collect some text like you can copy and paste, and you can't do that selection, that means you're not looking at text, you're looking at an image of text. And so Hadi would not be able to use a screen reader to access that content. Um, and so that's one way to look at them. Uh, the PDFs that you use that other people create, uh, you can, uh, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't appear to be accessible, learn about enough about it to be accessible, sometimes you can Google the name of that publication and you'll find another version of it that is more accessible. It might be an HTML version or whatever. But the other thing, and then you can you work with our staff to help you learn how to do the uh, PDF um, in, in for, your, uh, for your classes to make them accessible. Um, but another thing you can do is decide, at least don't use accessible, inaccessible PDFs the first week of school. Uh, because again, a student with a disability who needs them remediated we'll need to use the services of the Disability Resources Office. And um, you don't want to cut them too short on uh, time to do that. And that it is a reminder too, that you may not be able to do everything on this list, uh, but at least you can do some things. Using a text format, that's what we've talked about again. Um, structuring headings, talked about that, and lists and tables. Use descriptive text for hyperlinks. And uh, make sure that you have descriptive text for your images. Uh, you can access this PowerPoint on our website. We'll put up a recording of it and this, these PowerPoints. And you'll see, you can look and see. If you look under Tools, it says Accessibility. You can, can look there um, and look at the state of accessibility. And um, one thing it checks for is whether you have an image that doesn't have descriptive text or alternative text. And so if I have an image on the screen, it's very easy in, um, in uh, PowerPoint and other applications to click on that image and then add that alternative text. Who is that for? Well, that's for Hadi. And so he, know, he can tell there's an image there 
Uh, and he doesn't know if it's a, just a little flower or something insignificant, or maybe there's some real content in that image that he should know uh, is there. And so you should put that in um, using alternative text. So using large, bold, sans serif fonts can be helpful, like I'm doing today. Um, uncluttered pages, plain backgrounds, high contrast color combinations, and don't rely on color alone for our students to understand what you're saying. If you had two buttons on a screen and you had one was red and one was green and they were both round, there are some people who are colorblind that would not be able to distinguish those colors. Um, and so, and so you should have at least another way to tell what those distinguish between those buttons and maybe make the green one a triangle and the red one a circle or something. Use plain English, spell and define acronyms. Oh, acronyms, it's so easy for us to, to use them and think everyone knows what they mean or even um, other phrases that uh, everybody understands. And make sure your examples and assignments are relative to a diverse audience. So this is more, um, this is, includes an ability level, but also people from different cultures, genders, ages, and so forth. Uh, offer outlines and other scaffolding tools if that would be useful to your students to, to help them get started, even in an assignment, um, making sure that uh, that uh, they understand the very pieces in the assignment and maybe give them some tips on how they, they would organize their time in answering that assignment. Uh, make sure there's adequate time provided for activities and projects and tests. Uh, one way I deal with this is in my syllabus, I give very specific directions on all of the major assignments for the class. So that means a project that isn't due until the last day of the class is well defined for anybody in the class. And so they can judge how they want to organize their time and maybe save, save time initially. That can particular uh, use time initially to do on, to do some of that assignment to be prepared, perhaps because they have a health impairment and they're not always sure how much energy they're going to have, or they might even be in the hospital at times. And so they can organize around their issues, but it also helps students that um, have uh, different holidays that they celebrate or are going on vacations. And so they can get that work done early rather than waiting until late. And then provide feedback on parts of assignments and then corrective opportunities. And so a big term paper, you might have them turn in the uh, short description and an outline or something for you to review before you they actually go further in um, in that paper. So I've got two more things. I don't want to just make it twenty two. So I just this is just bonus. Um, and so uh, in order using the accessibility checkers in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Canvas, other products. Um, now that you know just as much as I've presented today, you'll know what some of those directions are they're giving you. Like in Canvas, when it tells you your PDF document is not accessible. It doesn't tell you how to do it, though, but it just can highlight some things. And there's a lot of things in this list that uh, any checker wouldn't be able to understand, like whether you spell out acronyms or, or whether your, pay, your uh, like modules are really organized well and so forth. And another thing to point out is when you're choosing the IT tools that you're going to use, like something maybe outside, particularly the Canvas system, you can check for accessibility page on their website. That's one way you can kind of get a hint on whether that tool is accessible to students with disabilities. Um, if they don't have an accessibility page on the website for the product you're using, it's a, there's a pretty fair chance that they haven't thought about accessibility in many companies that haven't. Most IT is not fully accessible. So you can check for that. You can also check for a VPAT, which is a voluntary product uh, accessibility tool used by the federal government. You can search online to find those. And the vendor may have filled one of those out. Um, now, again, underline the word vendor. You know, they, sometimes they kind of gloss over things, but they would say something about accessibility in there. And then you can also join a list. And I recommend Athen, A-T-H-E-N, uh, discussion list, which is for people that specialize in assistive and accessible technology at post-secondary level. Um, and uh, often they'll be post on there about how accessible is this product and whatever. And there's some archives so you can look back and inform yourself whether that question has already been asked. 
And also, as I mentioned, you can check and make sure it's operable with the keyboard alone. And so that's, those are a couple of things to think about. Now, this is very, very general, this list that I've given you, and you can look at the rest of it online. Um, and there are a lot of very specific questions. And you can find resources um, online. One of the problems with uh, Googling some of these questions, of course, is you get a lot of different answers and they don't always, uh, uh, can, they don't always agree with one another. Uh, but there's one source, source that we in the Do It Center have where we have over 700 articles um, and they uh, have to do with access for people with disabilities. And there are questions and answers and promising practices and case studies. And you'll see questions and answers along this line. Are there guidelines for creating an accessible math? Yes, we're not talking about that today, but if you're a math teacher or you're using those types of symbols, there are some guidelines in making that happen. How can I create math and science documents that are accessible to students with visual impairments? With a lot of images and so forth, it can be difficult, um, but there are guidelines out there for doing that. And our short Q&A will give you a short answer and then link to some of the, the resources that we find that we can trust. Um, and so, you know, describing images and, um, and uh, particularly when they're very complicated tables and images, uh, sometimes the guidance is to separate them into smaller chunks. And so you can present whatever the content is you're trying to present with those images. How do I create online math content that is accessible to students who are blind? What are some techniques for creating braille math materials? So forth. So there are a lot of very specifics if you go to the knowledge base. And so um, back to universal design, it's a framework. Um, it's an attitude. I kind of think of it as much an attitude as anything else. It's thinking about, like with the name tag, it's thinking about what is this for? What is my course supposed to be teaching? Um, and how can I do it effectively for uh, students with a, a great diversity with respect to uh, culture and race, ethnicity, gender identity, uh, ability, and so forth? It's a framework. Uh, it's a goal uh, that we we'll probably never reach. We'll ne never make our courses fully accessible at any particular student that might enroll in our class. And it's a process. We talked about that with the name tag. It values diversity, equity, and inclusion, and even is used as a platform for designing our DEI efforts um, around uh, the country at post-secondary institutions. We've used it at uh, UWIT uh, when we, we went through and, and uh, addressed some issues as far as DEI. It promotes best practices and does not lower standards. If you're lowering your standards by making your course accessible, then maybe talk with the Disability Resources for Students office and see how you can maybe you know, accommodate students without lowering your standards. It's proactive, can be implemented incrementally, um, benefits everyone, and minimizes the need for accommodations. And that's about um, what it is in, <laughs> in a nutshell. So. Who should do what is another question. I often hear from faculty that, well, this is a long list. So how can I be expected to do all this? I'm already short on time with all my other duties as a faculty member. And I get that. And I'm not saying today that you should necessarily do all these things, by the way. Um, we have the Disability Resources for Students office. They do their part and it's very specific. It's accommodations and they're um, serving the student, the, the student him or herself. And so they are providing an accommodation for a specific student in a particular class. But who else uh, could be involved? Uh, the IT accessibility team? Well, that's us here today. Um, look at our website and you'll see other offerings like consulting one-on-one uh, -on -one and with small groups. Um, we have a, a, a general showroom if you want to see the wide range of assistive technologies students with disabilities are actually using, uh, you can visit that. Um, but anyway, I encourage you to go to that website. So we're, we're doing things at, that, that kind of benefit anybody on campus, in this case, teaching an online course. Um, and so, but we're not the only ones that could provide support. Um, colleges, schools, they um, provide support for, for the instructors as well. And sometimes it assign a particular instructor to help other instructors. Um, and so well, you can look to different departments. We have a department on campus that has a person that, um, and probably some assistants as well, but 
who remediates PDF documents for their faculty. Uh, we have a department, probably several, that will do all the captioning of videos that you might be using. And there are ways to caption videos that are commercial um, and don't have captions. If the publisher doesn't have a captioned version, um, you, can, you can actually do that. But they have people that would do it for you. Um, and so, and then we have a, a department that spends quite a bit of time even teaching a, a presentations like this uh, to their faculty. And so they can work in small groups and so forth. And the Teaching and Learning Center um, in their programs and their resources on their website uh, provide things as well. And so you can think about it if you think, well, I, can, I don't think I should have to do this. Well, think about whether your department or your college or your school should, should get involved too. And so that's back to that stakeholder model I showed at the beginning of the presentation, that it's not all about you. There are just all sorts of stakeholders that could make an impact on uh, teaching accessible um, online courses. And so the resources that I wanna share and the URLs will be in the, the chat. Um, so you can look there. UW's Accessible Technology. That is the um, UW, uh, the, the Accessible Technology website for the University of Washington. And if you click on accessibility at the bottom of the uh, University of Washington homepage, you will find a link uh, to this page. And it has information about events that we're sponsoring and services, but also specific instructions on how to make your PDF documents accessible, your, your PowerPoints, um, and so forth. Uh, then we have the Do It website. Remember, that's the second group that I uh, direct. And it has a website uh, as well. And that's where you can find the knowledge base. But it's also where the Universal Design and Education Center is housed. And so they'll, you'll find all sorts of applications to, un, to uh, various activities and products in the education arena um, in that area. Uh, that's where the 20 tips uh, publication is located. Uh, but we also have another one called Equal Access, the Universal Design of Instruction. And it's much longer and it really goes into more detail about specific practices you can employ in your class uh, to make it more inclusive. And so much of that applies to online learning. Uh, the 20 tips, you'll all find those, all those will be in there too. But that's only a small part um, of that particular uh, publication. You'll also find a book um, and that's about in, creating inclusive learning opportunities in higher education, a universal design toolkit. Uh, and so that was published in 2020. And so you can find information about that there, but also that tutorial for 20 tips and other handouts that can give you a lot of this content. Um, and that, not as in much detail as in the book, of course, uh, but you can get a lot of this content. So I'd like to open this up for any questions. If anybody's posted any questions in chat or you'd like to now, I'll see if we can entertain a couple of questions. Hi, Cheryl. So Dan and I have been covering the chat, so we're pretty much caught up there. But if anyone has additional questions, we're ready to take those. Yes. I'll tell you one, one question I often get is, well, where do you get started with all this stuff? It seems like a lot to do, and it is. And I would say that two approaches, potential approaches might work for you. To pick one thing, like, well, I've got these videos I've created and they're not captioned, and just do that for a round or improve your organization or your instructions or something. Or you can start on the first week of materials and make sure that those are um, more accessible and inclusive. So the disability services office doesn't have to get involved in remediating. So um, another thing I get, if we have a longer workshop, we talk about individual assignments and that's really an interesting discussion. How can you make it accessible? I'll just give you one in my class. I have a lot of discussions in my class. And remember it's on universal design and higher education. So um, kind of related to what we talked about today. And one of the assignments when we're talking about universal design of physical spaces is for the students to go out and find an image of a physical space that is applying universal design features, but it's not labeled as such. It can't be on some universal design website like ours. Uh, and then to just to uh, attach it to the, in the discussion board, so, and explain why you think it's universally designed. And um, I say then right after that, I say, I, I thought at the time, you know, who would this not be accessible to? Well, obviously someone who's blind, 
okay, unless they're, they're images that have enough description, which isn't going to happen probably. Well, anyway, so I said, alternatively, um, you can just describe a physical space that you've been in um, and um, and describe, describe a feature that you'd call universal design and why. Um, and then for those that use the image, that first part of the assignment, I tell them they have to describe their image to the um, audience as well. And so the alternative is particularly thinking through a, a, a blind student, but rather than make it available to a student who's blind only, I make it available to the whole class. And there are always students who I don't think are blind, although the class is pretty accessible. You could be blind and I wouldn't know it, but um, they, they use that second alternative. And I think it's because, uh, I, I guess in the, the cases where it's come up, it's they, they just were excited about something they saw the other day, you know, and, or they thought about a grocery store and how you can walk up to the door and the, the, doll, wall, the doors open automatically and so forth. Um, and so universal design is about building that in. It can be built into the assignment rather than waiting for a student who's blind to enroll in your class and then providing accommodation for that one student. It benefits everyone. They all get that, that opportunity. And so universal design just makes your course more inclusive of a very broad audience and uh, hopefully will level the playing field uh, so ev everyone can participate equally. Thanks for joining me today. We do have a couple thank yous for you too, Cheryl. This was great. Thanks so much. And thank you, Cheryl, for the great presentation. I have to run to another meeting, but very helpful information. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me. Look at the accessibility website.